Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Startup Sense Podcast. This is your host, Jonah Lupton. Thank you so much for joining us today. Do me a huge favor and take a second to subscribe to the Startup Sense Podcast on iTunes or Google Play. That way you never miss an episode. Okay, to today's show. So our guest today is Gabby Lewis. He is the co-founder of a company called Exo. And what they actually do is they have created protein bars from crickets. I know that sounds a little crazy, but we're going to talk to him about why he's gotten into this business and what crickets can do for all of us. So let's welcome him to the show. Gabby, how are you, man? Doing very well. Thanks for having me here. So before we talk about what exactly you guys have created over at EXO, uh, first tell us what you were doing before this. Before this, I was in college. So I, okay. I grew up in Scotland. I moved to the U.S. to attend Brown University, studied philosophy and mathematical economics while I was there. And it was during my senior year at Brown when I stumbled upon this idea of, of eating insects. And that turned basically from a class project during my senior year into what's now a fully fledged VC backed business. Awesome. So, talk to us about how you got into this. I mean, it's not normal that we wake up a morning and say, I want to create products out of cricket. So, there must have been some motivation here. What was it? <laughs> yeah, totally. So, I, I was always very interested in health and fitness and food. And during my senior year, I was actually planning to go and work in finance had a nice, lucrative, but probably pretty boring job lined up when I graduated. And so I was kind of just biding my time during those final few months. And because I was so interested in fitness nutrition, I happened to be making my own protein bars. And I was combining almond butter and dates and other just real food, very natural organic ingredients. Uh, But I hit kind of a wall when I was looking for the right protein source to put in there. And when you're looking at the, the vast array of options, whether it's whey, pea, soy, rice protein, hemp protein, whatever it is, most of them have got some, some positives and some, some negatives. And so I was searching for that perfect protein source. And one of my roommates pointed out an article, which I think was in the BBC, suggesting that insects might be the ultimate protein source there. Packs full of the best quality protein, all the essential amino acids, high in iron, calcium, really just nutritious from every perspective. And they're also really sustainable and environmentally friendly. And so he kind of joked to me that I should put bugs in my protein bars. And at first I laughed it off. But then I started digging in deeper and realized that not only are insects eaten by about 80% of the countries all over the world, but there are really amazing arguments uh, for us to eat insects. And the more I read about it, the more it made sense. And eventually I decided to try and make some cricket protein bars. And so I made a very rough version of that in my dorm room at Brown. Gave them out to some friends and professors. Where did you get the crickets from? Did you go down to like your local um, animal pet store? It was a rough process. So we, at the time, there were a few cricket farms in the U.S. which were raising them for fishing tackle. And so I called up every single one of those farms. And I said to them, would your crickets be suitable for human consumption? And all but one of the farms laughed at me. And the final farm I called said, yeah, I actually eat my crickets every Friday. And so he was actually already doing it himself. So he sent me a few thousand crickets free of charge. And I made this very basic cricket protein powder, basically just from dehydrating and then uh, grinding up those crickets and put that into my bar recipe with the the nut butter and the dried fruits and everything else and made this basic batch of cricket protein bars and everyone loved them. What does a cricket cost? I mean, what did you pay? I mean, obviously it sounds like he gave you some of those crickets up front for free just to try it out. But I mean, what what does a thousand crickets go for? These crickets probably were going for $25 to $30 for a thousand crickets. A thousand crickets weighing about a pound. And do they, I mean, when you get them in a box, are they alive or are they already dead? Um, they come, they come live. Okay. So, so you, I you, had. Two, what's the dehydrating process like? Yeah. So it's changed a lot over time, but at those very early stages when I was doing it in my dorm room, essentially you get these shoebox type containers arriving <laughs> You can imagine all my roommates' faces when these chirping shoe boxes arrive to our dorm room. But you get these boxes of live crickets and you freeze them, which 
slows their metabolisms all the way down, puts them to sleep, kills them eventually. And then you remove the moisture. So you can do that in theory any number of ways. You could roast them, you could dehydrate them, drum dry, oven dry, whatever. In my dorm room, I just used an oven, removed all the moisture. And then I just threw them into my blender. And that was the kind of first very basic version of a cricket flour or cricket protein powder. The, the process has evolved a lot since then, but that was how it was done for that first batch of bars. Wow. I mean, do crickets by themselves, the powder, have any distinct flavor to it? They taste slightly nutty. I would okay. liken it to a, like a buckwheat flour. Uh, or a rye flour. It's like a dark, nutty flour taste. Okay. Certainly um, not unpleasant. Yeah, right. Nothing that's going to make you gag. No. So where did you go from there? So you made these these bars in your dorm room. Did you give them away to friends? Did you set up a website and start selling them? What What was next? Yeah, so after I made those first, first bars, I took the first batch to a local CrossFit gym and... Everyone at the CrossFit gym loved them. They happened to be doing a, an Olympic weightlifting seminar, and they had a famous coach in for the day. And the coach went crazy over them and started telling everyone to try them. And soon the whole gym was eating these cricket bars, and they all thought the product was great and was really tasty. But more than that, they thought the idea was amazing. And they'd never considered the statistics around why it makes sense to eat insects. So they were just blown away. And then the next day, I did the same thing at a local farmer's market. And again, same reaction. Everyone loved the product. Everyone loved the idea. And so after that, I had this kind of sequence of various proof points where strangers and professors and friends and everyone was just loving the product and the idea. And so a few months later, when I graduated, I teamed up with uh, my now business partner, my roommate at the time, and we decided to take the summer and see if we could really prove out the concept. And so we launched a Kickstarter campaign the summer after graduating. So this was the summer of 2013. And we set an initial goal of $20,000 to prove that we could sell $20,000 worth of cricket bars, which nobody had, had ever done. And we almost tripled that goal. And we raised $55,000 of pre-orders for cricket bars, which in reality, we had no idea how to make. And you know that next part of the process was, was challenging to say the least. But we, we did it. And so seven months after doing that Kickstarter, about eight months after graduating from college, we made our first batch of about 50,000 cricket protein bars, delivered a lot of them to the Kickstarter backers, threw up a website, and started selling them online. Awesome. That's a pretty cool story. Um, so a couple questions from that is, one, in the very beginning, when you were getting people to first try this bar, would you just have them take a bite and then tell them what was in it? Or would you actually tell them up front, hey, this is a, a cricket bar, you know, just they wouldn't be freaked out? We, we do a bit of both. Um, the, the former strategy of not telling them is definitely a bit riskier. Right. And you, you run the risk of someone getting a little bit upset, uh, especially a vegan who might get very upset. And we've, oh, we've right. had that experience okay. a couple of times. Yeah, good point. And sorry, could you, could you give me one second? Yeah. Sorry about that. Someone was trying to get into the conference room. Oh, no worries. Um, yeah, so you were saying, uh, you know, the, the risk of uh, of giving a bar to a vegan and not telling them. Yeah, basically a, a vegan or anyone who might be very uh, reluctant to consume a cricket. And so we, we've had a few experiences and, and now we now we tell people up front. So we're, we're very transparent about it. And, and actually that, that helps because... If you're doing a, a demo in a grocery store, for example, people don't really want to taste just another random protein bar because they all kind of taste the same. But if you tell them it's a cricket protein bar, the first cricket protein bar they've ever had, um, and maybe if they don't try it from you, they'll, they'll never get a chance to try it, it tends to get an amazing reaction. And so almost everyone's willing to try it. And then when they try it, they like it because it tastes pretty great. And then they hear about all the amazing nutritional benefits and environmental benefits and there's this beautiful light bulb moment, and then they tell their friends. So actually getting people to try it for the first time is one of the most amazing things, and it's always fun. So how do the macronutrients or the nutritional profile of your bars compare to a 
traditional protein bar, which I know is tricky because there's some protein bars that yeah. taste good, but they have tons of carbs and tons of sugars and fat. And then other protein bars, which don't taste as good, and they have less of those things. So you, yeah, uh, as, a, you, as a fitness person, you nailed you have to it. Totally, you nailed it right there. There's food is just a packaged food is just a game of trade offs. And so you've got with bars, we look at taste, macronutrients, and ingredients. And those are the three things. And you can basically pick two of them, you can't have all three. So you can either have amazing macronutrients, you know, 20 grams protein, zero gram sugar, okay taste. But if you do that, the ingredients aren't going to look very good, meaning that it's going to be a long list of ingredients that are tough to pronounce. It's artificial sweeteners. It's, it's not real food. So that's one philosophy. Or what we did is we wanted them to taste great, but rather than have a quote-unquote perfect macronutrient profile, we wanted it to most closely approximate real food as possible. So we use nut butters, dried fruits, honey, no preservatives, nothing artificial, just real foods that you could buy in a organic grocery store and you could make the bars yourselves if you wanted to. This is Jonah Lupton, founder of the Lupton Group and host of the Startup Sense podcast. Are you struggling to find the right tech team to build your company's website or mobile app? Maybe you've developed a product but need help with your go-to-market strategy, including branding and marketing. Well, stop worrying because my team at the Lupton Group can assist you with all of those needs. We specialize in helping entrepreneurs and startups of all sizes launch and grow their businesses. For a free consultation, you can email me at jonahlupton at gmail.com or visit our website at luptongroup.co. Yeah, what's, what's like the shelf life of your bars then? 10 months. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we've got some amazing food scientists who are able to, uh, you know, for example, you can reduce the amount of oil and therefore improve the shelf life by adding coconut flour and combining that with a nut butter. So there are kind of natural ways you can extend shelf life that don't involve uh, any processing or artificial preservatives. So we got some great guys on board who help us with that sort of thing. Um, but what it means is that our macros aren't like 20 and zero. We've chosen instead to use just whole foods, which is what we believe is the the better approach. Gotcha. Um, so talk to us. You mentioned a few minutes ago that you did a Kickstarter campaign. You raised, I think you said $55,000. Uh, yeah. But at that point, you guys really didn't know how the hell you were going to manufacture these bars. So how did you then take that money and set up the manufacturing process and produce the quantity you needed to get that product back to the Kickstarter backers? It was, uh, it was a challenging seven months. So there are basically... There are like two stages of making making protein bars. You can rent a commercial kitchen by the hour, send your own guys in there or do it yourself. And that's like a very fancy kitchen where, with large-ish scale equipment. And you can make them yourself and you can buy a little packaging machine. And generally people, when they launch a protein bar company, they'll do that until they reach about 10 or 20,000 bars a month. And then they'll outsource it to a coal packer which is a larger factory that makes bars for a bunch of companies and it's got machines that can make a bar a second uh, or, or even faster. And so we were in this weird position where we were almost too big to be doing it ourselves, but we were almost too small to be outsourcing it to a coal packer because most of them have a minimum of 50,000 or 100,000 bars per production run because their machines wow. are so large and cost so much mm -hmm. to, to run. So we spent a lot of time trying to find a suitable way to do it. Eventually, we found uh, an outsourced co-manufacturing partner who believed in what we were doing enough to make exceptions on their minimums. And so finally, after about seven months of searching and trying to figure out a decent solution, we were able to make the initial 50,000 bars and get them out to Kickstarter backers. Are you guys still using an outsourced partner for manufacturing or have you brought it in-house? Still outsourced. Different what, outsourced partner now, but still outsourced. What level do you guys think you have to be at before you can bring it in-house? Or is it just not something that you ever really want to try to tackle? Uh, usually, like you'll bring it back in-house when you're doing close to a million bars a month. So it's really when you're a pretty gigantic company that you bring it back in-house. Until, until that point, the economics doesn't really make sense. 
So you guys raised, uh, okay, so after the Kickstarter campaign, um, so I guess you're kind of considered bootstrapped at that point. Um, when do you raise some outside money from investors? So during the Kickstarter campaign, we did a very small, I guess, pre-seed round of about 300000 Okay. And that kind of got us through the Kickstarter, got us to the, the point where we could make that first batch of bars allowed us to feed ourselves very cheaply while living in New York. And and then we made the bars for the first time in March of 2014. And those first few months in terms of sales were really great. And we could barely keep up with demand. We were getting tons of press and attention. And so pretty quickly we decided that we needed to be able to make more bars and finance larger production runs. So later on in that year or so, summer, fall of 2014, we did a, a seed round of a million dollars. That was our first kind of real financing round. So I'm looking through your list of investors on Crunchbase and two names that pop out are Tim Ferriss and Nas. And I'm assuming this is yeah. Nas, Nas the rapper, right? It is Nas the rapper. Yeah. So how did you get connected to both of those guys and convince them to get involved with the company? Well, Tim Ferriss was top of my list from day one. And he really, you know, crosses every group of consumers we're trying to attract. And, you know, he's kind of our ideal consumer himself, actually. And so we'd wanted to get in touch with him for a very long time. We had tried every friend of a friend of a friend who told us that they knew someone who had once met him. And eventually, I think what came through is that one of our advisors, a guy named Jeffrey Zorowski, who who runs a bunch of or ran a bunch of restaurants in New York with Tom Colicchio. He was friends with Tim. He sent him some product. I believe at the same time as that, another one of our advisors, John Durant, who wrote a bunch of books on the paleo diet and related topics, also sent some bars to Tim. And Tim tried the product eventually and loved the product, gave me a call and decided to become an investor. So he loved the product first, but he still has to kind of believe in the the mission and what the future opportunity of the company is. So, you know, what, I mean, you don't have to give us the exact financial projections you used, but I mean, in your, in your mind, how big of a market could this be someday? And I'm sure it's more than just protein bars, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, look, it's very rare that there's an entirely new food category that you can own and dominate for, from nothing. And so... Even if we're looking at the protein bar market, which, which we're not, that's an $8 billion market. You add on protein shakes, it's another $9 billion. You sell the ingredient as a protein ingredient to other bar and shake and so on companies, that's about $37 billion. And then you can move into competing with actual meats and more conventional proteins. And so there are lots of different market opportunities uh, beyond just the initial supplements and, and high protein snacks, which we're looking at now. And so I think all of our investors saw that if you can make cricket protein uh, a viable alternative protein source, a la whey protein or soy protein or anything like that, which is what we're trying to do, the opportunity is enormous. And so that's, that's what everyone here is betting on, more so than just a, a protein bar company. Now, you guys are just selling online right now, correct? No retail? Online is about 80 to 90% of our business. We have a couple of flagship retail partners, Wegmans and Cebo Express, but the vast majority of our focus is our online sales. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, online, you're able to, you know, with marketing spend, you're able to drive traffic to your website where you can kind of control the message and educate the consumer as to why, you know, cricket powered protein bars make sense. Um, how do the retail stores do it? I mean, how do, you know, they're, there's not someone standing in the aisle next to your bars, you know, educating people. So, I mean, do they sell through retail all right, or is this really going to be an online company for a while? It's hard. You're right. I mean, we, you joke that they don't have someone in the aisle selling it. We try and do that when we can. So we, we do as many demos as we can. So we send people in to do samplings in stores as often as we can. We also try and train the staff in the stores. So we've got some really great retail partners where we can actually have access to their staff and, we can lead trainings for them so that when somebody goes up to somebody in one of these markets and says, like, I'm looking for a new protein bar, what do you recommend? The staff's actually trained in our products and can direct the consumer to that. So 
we do what we can to stand out in the sea of hundreds of protein bars that dominate the grocery store. But you're right, online is definitely easier because we can have an influencer or a blogger do some of the education for us and we're the, the one protein bar they're talking about rather than just being lost in this sea of so many of them. Right. So what what is what has been your marketing strategy to date? I mean, you guys have raised, you know, five million dollars. So you have some capital to spend. Um, you know, I'm sure a lot of that's gone into manufacturing and building up inventory and stuff like that. But on the marketing side, how are you guys driving traffic to the website? You know, be, besides influencers, any paid stuff? Yeah, or SEO? The, the vast majority of it's organic. We do a little bit of paid. So we do some Facebook ads. Um, we've had a decent amount of success with podcast sponsorship, actually. Ah, but the, yeah, the vast majority of it is is organic. Um, PR is, is really important for us. So we get an amazing PR person in-house who gets various media publications to write about crickets all the time, which is amazing and generating more awareness. And then influencers is also huge. You know, people people don't really listen to a brand saying like, eat our product, eat our product. So if we can, have, especially when it's crickets, so if we can have an athlete or a celebrity or someone like Tim Ferriss say, you guys should really eat these bars, they're amazing for all these reasons, it goes a lot further. Right. So talk to us about how do you, I mean, because there's listeners or at least part of my audience are entrepreneurs running startups and they're always looking for, you know, new marketing techniques that they can implement into their own businesses. And I think, they're, you know, with social media, obviously having so much power and leverage behind it, I think working with influencers, like you said, can be very valuable, but how do you find the right influencers and then how do you, you know, financially reward them for successfully promoting the product? Yeah. So it's definitely time consuming to find the right ones. And it's tough to really know if they're going to be the right ones until you just do it. So we, we identify, let's say seven different verticals where we want to go after influencers. So paleo, keto, tech bloggers, and, you know, four others. And then we'll we'll come up with just giant spreadsheets and lists of the top influencers in each of those spheres and the number of followers and so on and so forth. And engagement actually just just as important as as followers because we we've learned that often huge celebrities and actors with millions of followers will be a lot worse for us than a small nutrition blogger because people aren't listening to an actor who tells them to eat a protein bar. They don't trust that person for that sort of recommendation. Right. But they do trust the nutrition blogger. They they read the blog off. So we we've definitely learned that smaller and more niche is almost always more effective. And being on a a little triathlete blog has given us more sales than being in the New York Times. And right. it's also a lot easier to get on that little triathlete blog than the New York Times' website. So we've we've kind of learned where to where to put our focus. And in terms of rewarding the influencers, we we almost never pay straight cash for anything like this. We will align incentives. So we'll give influencers a, a percentage of the sales they generate. And then it's a win-win for everyone. But we we almost never just pay a flat fee for an Instagram post, for example. And we, we tend to think that when you do that, the, the, the person who's seeing it can kind of see through it as well. Um, right you know when someone on Instagram is the kind of Instagrammer who's just posting, you know, a different product every week because they've been paid for it. Now it's like every day, you know, the, the teeth whitening yeah. kids one day, the, you know, the belly cream for getting ready to sell you like the next day. It's like, it's, in, it's getting insane. Exactly. Exactly. So one thing that's really interesting is that everyone always says to us, like, how on earth are you going to get people to eat bugs? Like, it's crazy. It's such a, an uphill battle. It's never been done before, but, but actually, it has been done before, and there, there are lots of food groups that were once really weird or bizarre that are now totally normal to us. And so there are quite a few case studies that we can look to in figuring out the playbook for making crickets aspirational. So one of the, the ones we look at most closely is the example of sushi. 20 years ago, the idea, the idea of eating raw fish was totally bizarre to most Americans and Europeans. It's slimy, it's foreign, it's gross-looking and smelling. And now, 20 years later, it's totally mainstream. You can find it at almost every airport in America. And the way that it got there was through the California roll. And the chef in L.A., basically, he reimagined sushi for Western palates by 
hiding the raw fish inside rice and seaweed and turning it inside out. And he created this Trojan horse, basically, and hawked it in, in Hollywood and LA to celebrities. And it, it trickled down and outward from there until now, 20 years later, when it's almost completely mainstream. And so we, we draw two lessons from that. The first is that you've got to create some kind of introductory vehicle to get people to try it at first and then eventually eat more intense versions of it. And so that's where our protein bars come in. We view our protein bars as the California rule of eating insects, the kind of introductory vehicle to get people to dip their toes in. And then in a few years, they'll be eating a far broader range of, of insect-based protein products. And then the second lesson is that sushi spread from Hollywood. And so that's where the influencer marketing comes in. You've got to get people in various spheres with influence to tell their audiences that it's great to eat crickets for all these reasons and make it something aspirational rather than something that you have to do. So right now you have, looks like five different flavors. You have coconut, banana bread, apple cinnamon, blueberry vanilla, and peanut butter and jelly or PB and J. Uh, which of those are the most popular right now on the website? The coconut, which is basically chocolate, is the best seller on the site. Interestingly, the, the banana is the flavor that people like the most when they try all of them. I think for people buying a, a brand new product, they just tend to default to chocolate, which is why that's the best seller on the site. But banana is usually the favorite when everyone tries them. And then I know you guys also have uh, variety packs as well, like the classic variety, as you call it, where they can, I assume, get a couple of all these bars, right? Yeah, we've got variety 12 packs. We've also got sampler packs where you can just get one of each bar, try them all. Oh, cool. Talk to us about some of the metrics, right? I think this is interesting because, you know, like you said, you are kind of creating a new food category where people are looking to get information, maybe not buy right away. And then if you're able to gather their, you know, collect their contact information, like an email address, you can continue to educate them over time and hopefully turn them into a customer. So for instance, for every hundred people that hit your website, exoprotein.com, how many of them are you able to get an email address and how many of them are you able to actually get to buy? Yeah, we, I mean, we don't share those exact numbers, but we yeah. have a pretty surprisingly high conversion rate. We, we tend to drive people to a sampler landing page rather than just the, the straight website when we can. So, for example, if we have an influencer talking about it or an affiliate or if we're um, sponsoring any kind of media, we will use a specific landing page which drives them to a four-bar sampler where it is, 9.99 cheap shipping you can try our best selling four flavors and the conversion on that is really 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 high we don't make a ton of money on it but it doesn't matter right. because right. then like you said our job is to follow up with emails and educate them about why these bars that they they tried and they liked are actually amazing and and try and get a few more purchases that's smart yeah i mean even if we're, even if you break even on the sample pack just to get into people's hands get them to start talking about it get them to post pictures on social media and share it with their friends. I mean, then they come back and that's where you actually start making some money. Exactly. Exactly. And uh, the shareability factor is like really not to be underestimated. That yeah. is, you know, people always say to us like, Oh, you've got the get over this cricket thing, but really the cricket thing is what makes people talk about it more than anything. And it's what makes our bar stand out in such a credit category. And when someone tries a cricket bar for the first time, they want to talk about it. They want to tell their friends which works really well for us. Right. I totally agree. This is one of those those businesses or products that people, as soon as they try it, assuming that they like it, they want to tell everybody about it. And I remember I said the same thing about a year ago when my friend um, opened up a cryotherapy place. And I'm like, it's just one of those things where you go to, you know, go to do cryotherapy and it's like, you can't help not take, you know, a picture and put it everywhere on social media. So your friend's see you using cryotherapy and they think you're cool and you're trendy and and it's just like one of those things that goes viral this reminds me of that where you just want to tell everybody about it totally 100 percent. that's the goal how big is the team right now and are you guys currently doing any hiring and if so for what positions we are seven people full-time in the in the office in new york right now we're we're not hiring at the moment but we're we're always in the lookout for amazing people so even though there's no formal job descriptions up on our site right now. If we find someone fantastic, we'll, we'll snap them up while we can. 
what's been the biggest challenge so far? I mean, you've been running this company now for at least a few years. Um, yeah. You know, other than other than kind of like the branding, educating part. Besides that, because we, you know, we've talked that that's certainly a uh, an issue that you guys have overcome. But what what's what's next after that? Yeah. Well, I wouldn't say we'd overcome it. Actually, I mean, we're <laughs> it's ongoing. <laughs> we're constantly fighting the the consumer psychology, but that's the fun part. I think the big one of the biggest challenges that we didn't expect is just how hard it is to make a food product. And in many ways, the cricket element of what we're doing is one of the easier things. But just making a food product that tastes great and is shelf stable and arrives in the warehouse on time and as it should be and tastes right batch to batch is really hard. And so, you know, we've had problems with, with other ingredients that we'd have never expected that have kind of put our business on the edge. So, for example, a couple of years ago, our apple paste, which we use for our apple cinnamon flavor, it's a very unique uh, blend of dried apples that our chef found and liked. It got stuck in German customs for two months. And it was an absolute nightmare getting our apple paste relieved from these German customs officials. And that put us out of stock of that flavor for a couple of months. And we had to source alternatives. It was a massive headache that we would have never expected going into this. And it's little things like that that you you don't plan for. You know, we have we have backup cricket farms, but uh, we've got many of them, but we don't have many backup apple suppliers because we never thought there'd be an issue there. So it's just little things like that that you never expect. What have you learned personally over the last couple of years that's made you a better CEO today? I'm sure there's been a lot of learning lessons along the way. Not checking emails very often. Uh, and also just s- some emails just don't deserve responding to. So I think... Right. It's so easy to like do nothing as a CEO. It's so easy just to kind of be managing your team and being res- responding to emails from investors, advisors, press, random people, uh, and just kind of getting nothing done in the end. Um, and so trying to switch that off and whether that means bucketing all of that kind of mindless email work into 45 minutes at the end of the day, or just being more careful about what's worthy of response and what's not, or delegating more. Being able to control that is is being really, really important for myself and my my business partner. What's one trait that you think makes someone more successful than the next person? You know, especially when it comes to starting a company. I think it's I think it's related to the last point, and it's about perspective and knowing where to put your energy, but, but also knowing where not to put your energy. You know, there's, there's so much to do and everything always seems really, really important, but it's not. And, you know, we get frantic phone calls from buyers and retailers and investors all the time. And if, if you're the kind of person that lets that get to you, then you're not going to be a good, good entrepreneur because it's going to wear you down too quickly and you're going to burn out. So knowing to kind of, um, not not get personally affected by all the madness that's happening around you and being able to keep a cool head and maintain some some perspective, I think is super, super important. And it, it's not something that everybody has. I'm going to put you on the spot here. So of all your investors, uh, which one of them has given you the single best piece of advice and or made the single best introduction so far? You know, I think it might be the same one. Um, Jeffrey Zorowski who I mentioned earlier. So he introduced me to Tim Ferriss, which is a fantastic introduction. And one of the first pieces of advice he gave me was hire slow, fire fast, um, which is super important. And I think that's like one of the biggest mistakes founders make is they hire the wrong people at the beginning. Um, and then they, they don't get rid of them because it's it's hard to let go of someone, especially if you're friends with them or close with them. But it's, can be a death, a death blow if you keep them around when you shouldn't be there. Right. Especially for a small company. Exactly. Um, I, I heard an interview the other day with uh, someone that went to a dinner party where Elon Musk was kind of like the guest host. And they asked him, you know, if you could give one piece of advice to a startup CEO, what would it be? And he said, get rid of the negative people as quickly as you can. Totally. Totally. Uh, last couple of questions here. What's your number one goal for the company for 2017? We have a few new products that we're trying to launch this year. So bars, like I said, have been our, our sort of Trojan horse just to get the idea of eating insects out of there. And 2017 is about broadening the pie. 
and I can't say too much about them, but we're going to have some really cool products. They go go way beyond just protein bars. Any? Uh, can you give us any any guesses? <laughs> um, I mean, they're they're not they're not crazy products. You know, they're they're what you'd expect. We're moving into right, right. other protein categories, so powders, shakes, other snacks, um, anything that you'd want in a high protein form. We're we're either working on or hopefully working on soon. So, I mean, I guess the exciting thing is, is as you guys start to roll out new products, you've already developed a customer base through your website. So, I mean, you probably have thousands of customers that have already given you their email addresses. So once you guys launch a new product, I mean, you already have a built a built in buyer base, correct? A hundred percent. Yeah. And we've got, you know, tens and tens of thousands of customers who enjoy our bars every month and are eager to, to try cricket protein in different form factors. So it's definitely going to be uh, easier to launch these products than if we were a, a cold brand doing it. And by the same token, we get retailers who are enjoying sales of our bars right now and we'd be happy to uh, broaden the category of insect protein to include other products. And hey are you guys on Amazon right now? We are, yeah. How are, how are sales on Amazon? I mean, if you guys probably don't promote that Amazon as much because you're giving up a fee to them. So people are just going to Amazon and finding it organically? Yeah, pretty much. Um, yeah, it, it's there because it, it's sort of a requirement for a food product to be on Amazon these days. And especially because plenty of people won't even search in Google for a product. They'll just go to Amazon. So right. we're Crazy. up there, but we'd obviously prefer somebody to buy it directly from us so we can have that relationship with the, the consumer. Now, as you guys continue to build the brand and offer more products around, you know, crickets or cricket flour, et cetera, uh, does that give you more leverage and attention from some of the big retail stores that you may go into? Yeah, it definitely gives us more attention, though, though I'd say we've already got more than enough attention from one of these retailers. Even though the, the bar category is really saturated, it's just all the same stuff. So yeah. if you go into Whole Foods or, or wherever, you'll see hundreds of bars, but they're all just whey or soy, and a couple of them are pea, um, and they all taste the same. They're all the same flavors, all the same price. So to have something that's so radically different as cricket protein definitely gives us a leg up with these retailers, and they're definitely really excited about it already. But the more products we have, the even better it's going to be. Awesome. Last question for you. If you were to sit down with uh, someone looking to start a company in the food industry, uh, what advice would you give to them? I'd tell them to try and just do one thing right, which is not advice that we follow ourselves. So... I mentioned that we're involved in the farming, the processing of the ingredients, the manufacturing of the bars, branding the bars, everything. It's really too much. We do all of it because it's it's necessary for what we're trying to do, but it's definitely not optimal to be doing all those things. So if you can do just one of those things really well, meaning if you can outsource all your ingredient sourcing and production and just focus on building a brand or let someone else build a brand, but you just get really good at making one ingredient, um, that's a really great way to succeed quickly in this business. I think that's great advice. Absolutely. And then later down the road, you can start to take over, you know, different pieces of the, of the food chain. Awesome advice, man. Um, for the audience still listening, what is the best way for them to find you? Exoprotein.com. And if anyone wants to email, it's, my email is just Gabby, J-B-I at Exoprotein.com. Great interview. Really appreciate all the information. I appreciate you coming on and spending some time with us. Um, sounds like you guys are off to a great start with the company and it sounds like there's some exciting things happening around the corner. So wish you continued success and feel free to come back anytime and give us some updates. Amazing. Thanks so much for having me, man. You got it, man. I'll talk to you soon. Have a good one.